If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Our guest today is Ben Netterfield. Ben's been on before. He was a previous guest and an early guest at that in 005. And then he also came back as one of our more popular choices for Listener's Choice in episode number 142. Today, Ben's going to talk about 10 essential tips to deal with fear and anxiety as a rider, which as far as I know, every single rider at some stages had fear or anxiety, but we might confirm that with Ben. How are you today, Ben? Good, thank you, guys. Thanks for having me back. Ben, if we can um, talk about this whole fear-anxiety question, and first of all, is that right that no one has escaped this fear-anxiety? Is it always, or or are some people just naturally brave and I just haven't met them yet? (laughs) (laughs) There there are people that don't feel fear in the same way that the majority of the people do. Um, You'll see them sometimes with extreme sports talking about they they really just their high comes from doing the perfect technique or the perfect maneuver in a certain sport mm-hmm. so they're quite unusual and obviously fear fear for them is actually is quite a hard thing because then they have no their body isn't telling them this this is maybe way outside your skill like so they have to look at things a lot differently than most of us and how they judge if they're going to do an like an extreme task or an extreme sport situation you go over um, in kayaking, going over falls or you know free falling for further than anyone else has done. Yep. Yeah, so they they actually have their their own set of problems with that. But yes, most of us, the majority of us, are, are blessed with actual fear, which <laughs> is actually good for us. Good. Which doesn't necessarily feel that at the time. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if we can talk about that, that'd be great. And this is not really horse training. I mean, we're we're assuming here that the horse has got a fairly good temperament and able to do whatever we're asking. Is that right? And then we can focus on the rider. Yes. Yep. If if we sort of assume on that level, because otherwise it gets a lot more complicated. But yeah, if we make sort of the assumption that the yep. horse is basically right for the job mm-hmm. and experience level and, you know, can be a little green, obviously, but, but it, it wants to do the right thing and it's combining well with the rider itself. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, if you could just introduce us to this and will we start with the first one? There's a question here that I know you've got on your notes. And the question is, what would I do if fear didn't matter? And is this what the 10 points are about? Yeah. So that's very much then like, what would I stand for? Like, what do I actually want to do, you know, with my writing? Like if if fear wasn't holding me back or, Mm -hmm. you know, what do I really see myself doing? And so that's, That's sometimes then an underlying of how much, because overcoming fear sometimes is how much we want to do, because it is going to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Change of any sort is uncomfortable. So learning to deal with fear, learning to deal with the actions, learning to deal with the sensations is going to be uncomfortable. So how much do we want to do it and what do we want to do? The other important thing with that is a lot of people then will compare themselves or aspire to be someone else. And it's very much your own, this is where you, you're talking purely about yourself. Like, mm-hmm. what do you want to do? Not not what your friend has done, not what you know your father's done, not what your great uncle has done, not what your mother's done. What do you want to do? Yeah, it really becomes their own personal journey then, isn't it? Yes, very yeah. much so. Yeah, yeah. Very much so. Okay, so at the beginning, is there three questions we need to ask? Yeah, so they're basically called the resilience formula, which, like a lot of these sort of things, is a bit confronting first up. So the the very first question is, do you want to do this? Like, do you want to put yourself in this place or do you want to leave? Like, you don't have to, you know, say say if you're doing eventing, let's take that as an example, because mm-hmm. you're putting yourself obviously in some danger of some sort. And you know, is this what, like you can still love being with horses, love interacting with horses, love doing lots of things with horses, but do you want that whole package that comes with eventing? You know, maybe you find out that you actually still want to be with horses, but not in this sense. Mm. 
And so that's the first really big question is, do you want to do this and how much do you want to do it? And so that leads into, if you do want to do it, you know, what are you prepared to change? And with that, what are you prepared to accept? Because nothing becomes, I say, we don't take fear away. We don't suddenly magically, I wish we could sometimes, wave <laughs> a magic wand and, and take everything away, but that's, that's just not how it's going to work. So it's learning to accept there's going to be certain feelings of uncomfortable and you know, nerves and, and all those sort of things will, will be there. It's how, it's how then we learn to deal with them. And then the third question of that is if you don't want to change but you do want to stay exactly what – then basically you're, for want of a better word, like you're going to feel that you're going to be miserable because what you're dealing with now is what you, how you're going to stay. And that's those are the basic three choices. You've yep. got leave, stay and change what you can change and accept what you can't change, or stay, give up and do the things that make it worse for you. Um, they're your basic choices, which mm-hmm. are quite uncomfortable choices when you look at them that way. But that gives you a starting basis from where do I go to from here? What do I want to do from here? But it also gives you a choice. And I think if you've got a choice, you've got a certain amount of freedom, haven't you? You can decide. It's yes. your choice. You decide. Yep. Yes, very okay. much so. And that, okay. and that's sometimes what, what we don't, you know, a lot of people skirt around those three questions. Whereas if you actually go to the person, well, this is how this will work. You know, mm. you, can, you can change. And you can learn to adapt and accept. Or you can stay exactly as you're doing and basically history will keep repeating itself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for a greater or lesser extent. Okay. All right, so say we've decided that um, this is what I really want to do, I really do want to improve, what do we do then? Yes, that's hopefully the wonderful decision that most people make, that they actually do want to do this, and and it may be in a slightly different shape, Sure, but most people then choose to stay and learn how to to cope and learn how to overcome things and learn how to understand things so they have tools that they can use when they're feeling uncomfortable or they're feeling frozen. Mm -hmm. So all through these 10 points, the most important thing is to remember to be flexible. Like it's not a step-by-step points. It's, you know, some days you'll be, okay, I need to learn to be present or I need to learn to be breathing or I really need to concentrate on my fundamental skills. So that will always change on a daily basis or weekly basis. But the very first thing that we, we generally talk about is people that are dealing with fear is learning to be present and breathe. And I think we've all been in that situation where you're, you're feeling quite nervous about something and, and you literally just stop breathing. Mm. And of course, you know, once that, that happens, now our body's basically going into shutdown mode. Mm-hmm. So then I can't use my hands, I can't use my legs. I can't move my shoulders. I can't do a lot of things. So now the horse is getting this sensation of, oh, where did my rider go? So it's gone from a person that has been communicating to them to a now person that's either completely removing themselves from the situation or the very least is just sitting there being a very compliant passenger. Okay. Okay. So when you go to that be present and breathe, that, that basic concept, it depends on how much fear you're obviously having and how overwhelming that is. So generally the concept of being present is to look around, to observe where you are actually at the moment because generally fear will take you into a past tense, into your brain is very good at going, remember what happened last time, this is what happened last time. So then it goes back into that. I found out that last folder that we encountered these situations and it just gives you an action replay of that. So being present is actually, where are you right now? This is what you're doing right now. So that is observing, looking around. Can you, the thing of, can you see five things? Can you hear three things? Can you feel? Obviously, the feel is very easy for us as riders because we've got a horse underneath us. But but that whole being present is to actually draw you to being right here, right now. And that's the only time that matters. Those past experiences aren't, you're not dealing with them right now. You're dealing with where you are right now. So a lot of that is is just getting the person to be where they are and then breathing so you start that cycle. So you often talk to runners, their breathing cycle is very similar in terms of breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your mouth, and that one, two, three. So you're just starting that cycle. So then it becomes 
a robotic form and the body is then getting oxygenated basically so then the muscles can be used. Right, right. And just thinking about that being present, you know, hear five things, feel three things. It really is about the here and now rather than the past and what's happened. Yes, and that's a very strong point Mm. that most of us have a brain that will go, by the way, do you remember the last time you were here? And, of course, then those overwhelming sensations can flood back into your system, whereas that might have been led from, say, it was a very strong wind at the time, um, whereas now it's a calm, still day. So you're just observing where you are right now. Yep, yep. What your horse is doing, what you're doing. Um, and so, yeah, it's just getting, basically, very much getting in touch with your present moment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, I know that you said that, you know, the order, even though we're talking about 10 essential tips, the order's in what that might change, but also the timing of that. Is that the same that some people are going to go, right, I'm breathing, I'm present, now what do I do? Whereas others might just focus on being breathing and, and present and that might be their main focus for an hour for oh, longer. Yeah. Is that is that the same? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Very, yeah. very much, very much so. Like for some people, just being there and remaining there and being present is a huge like we took that exposure a little bit later, but that's a huge step forward. Mm-hmm. And just allowing themselves that that is a step. Like, you know, sometimes you, you feel a little defeated, oh, all I did was this. But if you're present during that and you're breathing and you're able to move your body, that's a hugely positive step in terms of being able to progress. That's, that's your base to be able to progress from. Um, so, you know, some people, the the usual thing of time will rob you of that in terms of getting present feels like in your brain when you're in panic mode, it feels like it's taking forever. Usually getting present may only take two, three, four, five minutes. You may still be nervous during that time afterwards, Mm -hmm. but it feels much longer. And just allowing yourself to observe, allowing yourself to look around, allowing yourself to hear the horse's movement, or even if you're still just to feel the horse's breathing, you know, all those sort of things are, are a very big positive step for a person that is, has been gripped by fear. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. All right, so once we've got that established, being present, breathing, what's next? What can we work on next? So the usual, the next thing is our brain is immensely, it's the grand champion of beating yourself up with. <laughs> it can tell you all the things that you've done wrong, all the things that you should be worried about, and that's basically what it's programmed to do. It's it's called the helpful brain in terms of it's supposed to keep you away from danger. So it's going to highlight all the things that it thinks are terribly wrong with this situation from your past, from anything that it's concerned about. Because what you're looking to do is actually notice those thoughts. Most of us spend a lot of time trying to brush them away. Oh, be be tough, be strong, be, you know, don't. And so you spend a lot of your mental energy actually trying to ignore <laughs> ignore <laughs> the brain. Whereas actually what we learn to do is actually notice what the brain is saying. So in other words, you know, as we we're just saying for last time you were here or, you know, have you done enough work or people are going to laugh at you or, or people, um, you know, all, all the different things that we all do um, with that, um, people are going to listen to this podcast, go, oh my God, what's he talking about? You know, that, that sort of thing. The brain comes up with these things that will quite happily beat you down with. And it's, it's actually just noticing that and allowing yourself to go, okay, I can hear myself being nervous about that. I can, and, and then what we do with that is we then name it. And by naming it, we're going, that is often the term that we'll we'll often use with clients. And it it resonates for different people for different things. But often we call it radio doom and gloom. (laughs) And the doom and gloom is, oh, that is very loud today. So in other words, oh, you're you're going to fall off. You're going to, this is going to happen. You're you're not capable of doing this or you really shouldn't be here or all those sort of things. And then what we tend to try and do is we go, okay, radio doom and gloom is turned up really loud today. And by just noticing and naming it, it's amazing how much that puts it into perspective of it's actually just my brain being protective of me. It's yeah. nothing to do with actually what's happening at this stage, at this moment, in this environment. Once you've done that, that will then, you know, is my brain controlling my actions 
or thoughts or is the present controlling them? So in other words, you know, is it past or is it present? And what am I looking to do for the future? Yep. And that's just being aware. And so instead of pretending and hiding from it, you're actually noticing it and then what we call naming it. And as I say, different people have different things that they, you know, I usually like to, a lot of the clients I work with talk about it as radio doom and gloom. So if you imagine it's a radio station that's turned up really loud today and what we then learn is skills to actually turn it, not to turn it off, but to turn it down so we can then operate in the present and actually do what we need to do to get our writing in. Yep, yep. No, that makes sense. I think that um, and having a radio that you can just adjust the dial, it yes. puts it into a different perspective and, and something that you can sort of have a bit of a – Oh, yeah, almost a bit of a joke and you're a third party and you yes. can hear it's like you're observing something going on rather than it being yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yes, very much so. All, all those little things really help. And the biggest thing is we teach people that you're not turning it off, you're just letting it be to the side and just noticing it, it being there and then coming back to the present and learning how to, okay, these are the things I want to do. So the next thing along with that is then – learn to be in touch with your body. So the the other thing, as we talked about at the beginning, which was being present and breathing, is most of the time that will lead into either hypersensitive or hyposensitive, like where the body is, is either getting very twitchy or wanting to shut down. And being in touch with your body is basically, um, so as riders, generally we get people to shrug their shoulders, wiggle their fingers, um, wiggle their toes, Sometimes it's moving in the saddle. But what that happens is it actually just allows the brain to actually move your body as you've asked it to and for you then to go, I have control of my body. Whereas often those shutdown mechanisms are taking that control away from you. So, of course, even if you're making the world's most amazing decision about something that you need to do, if you're not in touch with your body, you can't enact that decision. So it's, it's learning to be present, to be able to move your body, internal control, and that makes that whole presence thing much more, this is why I'm here right now. Yes. That will really help with, with people. Also, it, it also now gives them something a little bit to do, which helps break them into that cycle of being, I'm present now. Okay. Okay. And I see what you mean now. You know, we've got the 10 tips, but we're sort of saying, well, if you're present and you're breathing, then you can be more in touch yep. with your body and have that internal control. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. And that often giving the people that are feeling fearful, that feeling that they actually are still in control or have a say of what their own body is doing mm. is a big step forward because as I say it not only gives them the personal control for themselves, but it also generally then interacts with being in present and then being able to assess and and look out and do, you know, basically then what needs to be done later on. Yes, yes. Wait, can you hear anything? No? That's because we're waiting for someone with a good quality horse product to be advertised here. If that's you, then contact us, horsechats at horsechats.com, and we'll send you the details. Thanks. All right. If we can go on then to um, number five, that'd be good. And we'll, we'll touch on these just, you know, when before we sum up, just in case people are sort of yep, no, missing <laughs> missing the numbers, we can um, touch them. They'll be on yep. the website as well. But if we can go on now, we've got, uh, we're in touch with our body. We've got the internal control. What's the next tip? What are we working on now? So the next main thing is, you know, what are my fundamental skills? So Probably the easiest way of me to talk about this in a simple way is if in show jumping, what we think of as our fundamental skills is quality of canter, line, and controlling our position. Yep. And so what we're making sure is we're prioritizing them. They are our most important things because what happens when we're in fear or in stress is our brain is basically getting spammed. So if you think of an email account, being absolutely spam with information because when we're feeling anxious, we have all this information bombarding our brain. So that information can be internally, could be externally from the horse, could be externally from the weather, or it could be any any number of different things. But that's also, as we said, with radio doom and gloom, that's then being turned up very loud. We're being spammed with 10,000 emails 
every five seconds, our brain's going to go, I don't know what to do. I have no idea how I'm going to deal with this. I don't know what to do first. And what we're doing in this situation is we're thinking, how does any of this information relate to those fundamental skills? The fundamental skills is quality of counter, line, and position. And just keep training the person. Just keep coming back. Nothing else matters except those three things. So it doesn't matter if a horse is, you know, 50 metres away from you countering the opposite direction. Is my counter sufficient? Am I on my line? Am I balanced? Mm -hmm. And so you just train the person to keep coming back to those fundamental things. And so they keep prioritizing. So then the brain is more able, instead of being spammed, is actually able to put all those things in the bin. And once you can clear the mind a lot more of those things, the mind and body aren't getting all those feel sensations that, what about this? Did you think of that? Did you know, that, did you realize that this horse tripped 10 strides ago? And so you're back in that past sense again. And you're also back in that sense of, does this matter? Like, what priority do I put on things? On those fundamental skills is a really important step because then that leads into what we call our decision-making loop. So we go into what are we observing? And so in this situation, if we're thinking of those fundamental skills, we're observing the quality of canter, the line, and our position. And so then... We go from observe to orientate. So how I would like, so if we take line, is the horse where I'm expecting it to be in line with this next jump? And then if it's not, what's my decision? My decision is to bring it, say, to the left, and then it becomes an action, and then the action goes back to the observation. And so that's what we call our decision loop. So you observe, orientate, decide, and then act. And that loop is continuous. So in other words, a lot of people that are feeling fear will get to one point of that loop and then be stuck. And it's training them how to go through the loop completely and then go all the way back to observe. Because obviously after our action, we have to decide, did it work? Did it not work? Where are we now? Yep. Yeah, I like the um, amount of choice that you're giving people because we're really, you know, starting off with the three questions. We're choosing, aren't yep. we? We're choosing to yes. turn down radio doom and gloom. We've got this decision-making loop now and we're making the choices about how to deal with this fear and anxiety. It's not something that's overtaking us. It's giving us the freedom to choose. Yeah. No, this yes. is good. This yes, is good. very so, much so. Um, yep. We can go on now to, um, yeah, what's... Uh, so what's in my control and what's not. And that's, yep. we all prioritise the things that often aren't in our control. So things that, that are obvious that aren't in control, we, we don't, well, I certainly don't. I don't have control over the weather pattern of the day. I certainly don't have, like, we're dealing with a coach or our parents or our partner. I don't have any control or very little control over their moods. And you're just looking at, you know, how much does that affect me and learning that we're not looking to change them. We're looking how do we accept and cope with those situations. So in other words, if we take the weather as, as a good one, of what are my tolerances? Like if it's really wet, what's my risk reward? Do I go and ride and learn how to overcome those fears and anxieties about being in the wet? Or, you know, this is too wet and this is too slippery. And those are the decisions that you're, that you're basing on. This is what I want to be exposed to right now. In other words, if I want to be a competition rider, then I've got to slowly learn to be able to ride in, you know, all sorts of different weather events. But if I'm, you know, not a high performance competition rider, then what is realistically, what do I need to be exposed to? Like if it's blowing a gale, no, I definitely don't need to be outside. But if I'm learning to expand my horizons, then I'm, as we said before, maybe just being in a light wind, I'm just letting myself be outside with my horse in that situation, being present and breathing, that's a big step forward. So once again, you have different scales for what you're wanting to do. And so that becomes, you know, what's acceptable and what's tolerable. And by tolerable, we mean what's bearable. In other words, I can, I feel uncomfortable, but I can allow myself to be in this situation and then what I don't want to endure. And so that still comes back to those very first three questions of, you know, leave, learning to accept or just staying miserable, basically. And that's a really important guideline as to 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 what you're doing with your with your sport with your horse with the interaction that you're having yep yep 
yeah no I think I think all the way through you're sort of asking yourself questions and um I think this we can we can sort of move on then to the next the next point the other thing is too that um it's very easy to blame everything and everyone but really the techniques you're using is is putting us in control that we can you know accept it move on and we've got a lot of choice there. We can't just say, well, it's all everyone else's fault or it's all the weather's fault because everyone's co- <laughs> all your competitors are coping with the weather. Everyone is. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, very much. And that, that comes back to, you know, that first part of, you know, the envy, which is, can be part of fear as well, of mm-hmm. where, you, you know, you're comparing yourself to someone else and, and you don't know exactly what's going through their mind at the same time. They may be even more scared than you are. They're just dealing with it in a different way. And so you have that, and that can also then come down to, you know, where our brain then beats us up. Oh, look how competitive A is doing. Like, they're doing so much better than you. I can't believe you're doing this badly. You know, how could you not show more courage than this? Yep. And that's that can all still be then part of that radio doom and gloom of, we'll notice that thought, like, be aware of that thought. Don't let that thought then control you to go into the next actions of then you know, withdrawing or, you know, your pathway is completely different. Your pathway is maybe just to be there on the day. That was a big, that's a big step forward for you. Yep, yep. All right, I think we're right to move on to the next point, and that's number seven, isn't it, about learning how to use your tools, fill your toolbox? So if you if you think of the, the emergency or toolbox mm. is most of us don't necessarily think of this until we're already you know, consumed by fear or, or consumed by the action itself that is leading to that fear. In other words, if you're talking about a beginner and they have no understanding of if a horse was to take off, what do they do next? Like there's there's obviously some reflex actions, but they don't have that set of skills that this is this is what you do. So the toolbox that we're talking about is actually for a person that is in fear is if this situation, if you're being exposed to a, to a horse that, that does tend to, and of course, fear is different for everyone. So someone's sense of acceleration with one horse is someone's you know, barely ambling it for another. But your sense of fear is that this horse is going too fast. And so what are the tools you're going to use when you're feeling panicked or nervous of how to get this horse to stop? And so... It may be the first thing I'm going to do is sit up nice and tall, look to my left or right, which way I'm going to turn my horse, and then I'm going to turn in that direction until I can get a one rein stop. So that the person has a definite set of criteria that they're going to follow. If this sensation, in other words, the horse, in my opinion, is going too fast, I'm going to sit up tall, look, one rein, and turn in that direction until the horse has stopped. And so you've just given them then uh, this is black and white what you'll do if that sensation. So then they have that sense of learning how to control in that situation. So they actually have set procedures. So obviously in aviation you have a lot of things where they'll practice over and over and over again of in the situation you'll go to this routine. And that's the same for people that are feeling nervous because basically what the brain will do is what we call load shedding. In other words, the more overwhelmed it's feeling, the more it'll go back to, I don't understand, I can't cope with all this information, and it's just basically shutting down. Whereas the more we can go in this situation, say if the horse is coming to a combination and it's starting to drift, normally you're feeling very nervous, this is the action that you'll actually do. So you've actually talked them through the exact action that they'll use in the toolbox at that stage. So they can reach into their toolbox and go, I know how to deal with this. And it's just basically giving them things they can reach into the toolbox and go, I know how to deal with this situation right here, right now. Yep. And it's basically on the principle that neurons that fire together, wire together. In other words, if if I learn how to use that toolbox, every time that horse drifts, this is what I do. So then that action becomes faster and faster. So the horse obviously barely drifts and and they're able to keep it more or less straight the whole time then. Mm. And so then, of course, then the consequences are going further and further. So then the confidence of the rider comes up more and more yep. during those yep. episodes. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. 
horsechats.com. And then if you think back to one of your bad memories, you can almost override that with using what's in your toolbox so that it may have been about to happen, but you could override it and um, use your tools yes. and have a good outcome. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that's the same, like we talk about the visualisation now, which is one of the later ones, where like, you know, everyone talks about visualisation in terms of if you just visualise the task, but they don't explain that it's okay for that task not to be going like say for example for me when I was trying to when I was first told to you know do visualization skills I had no idea what people were really talking about so I would sometimes visualize and of course when I was trying to visualize the the bad thing would happen the whatever I was worried about would actually pop into my vision yeah then I would spend the next four five six hours trying to suppress that thought with it just repeating and replaying overnight because as soon as it would pop up, I would just start trying to press it and dash basically out of the vision. Whereas if you let that vision sit and then think, well, how do I solve this problem? How do I, what skills will I use to overcome that? And for sometimes, for some people with visualization, it's quite a strong sensation as, as well as actually imagining what's happening. Like it can be a whole sensory experience. And so it's, it's the ability then to actually sit in that moment allow yourself to solve that problem, allow yourself to solve that puzzle, and then, okay, those are the tools, same thing again, those are the tools I will use when I feel that thought or have that thought or have that sensation or the actual horse does that situation, you know, because that can be the same thing as well. So visualization in that sense can be really good once you understand the skills of how to use visualization, where sometimes, you know, people that are quite nervous, what they'll visualize is actually the thing that they're most worried about. So, of course, then they're now totally hypersensitive to what they're about to do, thinking this can only go wrong, basically. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you use visualization, same thing as just letting yourself sit in that, letting yourself solve the problem. How do I solve this problem? And if you're not sure, then that's the time to talk to your coach and say, well, this vision is coming up. You know, what, what do I do to help me solve that situation? And then they can go back to it and actually replay it and learn then, Okay, this is this is what I'll do. This is this is how I want to act. This is the thought I want to have because that thought then becomes a priming act, which then the priming act then allows your body when when the actual task does happen, when the actual action does happen to actually enact the, the thing that you want to do rather than be frozen by it. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, if we can move on to the, and you, you talked about it briefly before, and you're right, these tips certainly interact with each other, even though they're all distinctly yep. different. The little bites yep. of exposure. The little bites of exposure. So what we often, um, and people will naturally, when they're sitting and talking about it and, and planning, think of two bigger too big a bite. They're wanting to to really step forward and show courage and do those things. And then, of course, when they're back, you know, in the furnace of exposure, all those thoughts and feelings overwhelm them. So the big thing is, you know, instead of having one big step forward of having, you know, six, seven, eight, nine little steps. And with those steps, it's also the antecedents, which is what is the thought, feeling, and sensation that happens before the action. So, in other words. If I'm nervous about cantering, but my action is that I don't tell the horse clearly to canter, but I've actually already nervous about it and already starting to think of all the things that can go wrong with it before I've even done it. So it's then actually acknowledging, once again, what we talk about with that noticing and naming, acknowledging those thoughts and feelings before of actually going into the canter. And so if we talk about someone who's quite nervous about movement or the sensation of the horse, you know, sometimes the first exposure that we do is actually not with the horse at all. So we take them away from the horse and, you know, put them on a drum and we ask them to do a little bit of visualization technique, but also then we, we move the drum. And it's amazing how much that movement of the drum can then feel when a person is nervous because they don't have control over that movement, getting your body used to the sensation of something you don't have control over. Mm. And that's also what we're talking a little bit more with acceptance as well. So tiny workable steps towards goal is a really important thing to plan out rather than just go, I'm going to be brave today, I'm going to do <laughs> this and this. Yes. 
And we, we've all done that because you, you, you always want to show or think you're showing doing the right thing, but it's often little tiny things that build a stronger foundation. Yep, yep. All right, now we talked before about focus and visualisation. Do we need to say anything more about that? Change the order? Um, that's probably actually we've done most of that. I say the, the big thing, you know, people do visualisation in quite different ways and, and just allowing yourself to learn what's best for you. Like some people, you know, totally get into the writing clothes and, and reenact, you know, sitting in a chair, whereas some people can, you know, just stand by the arena for 30 seconds and put themselves in that. So it really works what's best for you in terms of do you need it the day before, the morning of. Sometimes one of the things I used to do if I was trying to do that sort of thing was if you did the visualization session and then after it you wrote down those three fundamental skills that were important, say, for that horse. Yes. You know, so if, if this horse lacked impulsion through a left-hand canter, I wrote those three things down that were important for that ride. And then in the morning, I'd rewrite them down. And then just as I was getting on that particular horse, as I was first walking around, I'd just have that. So once again, it's just in your forefront. So you just got a routine then that keeps bringing the things that you want to want to do, those priming acts that you want to do into the foreground. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, to finish off, we've got seven R's for lasting change. What's the seven R's for lasting change? So the seven R's are reasonably straightforward in terms of if you're trying to change, these are general things. So if you're wanting to change things in general, like any actions or thoughts or feelings, it's a reminder of what we're wanting to change, how we're wanting to do it and things like that, like what actions breathe, you know, those sort of things. So those little reminders that we're thinking of, like of those action plans that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. So the big thing, once again, like we're talking with the tiny exposure and then reward yourself, like acknowledge that you've just done that, where sometimes we all get up, but I'm not at the final goal yet. And that's, that then takes away from the effort that you've gone to get to that first step or the second step or the third step. So if it's giving yourself little rewards or just little reminders that you've achieved and you've done that. And so that's where the records of little notes to say to yourself, these are the thoughts and feelings I had today. This is how I overcame them, those. And that allows you to understand progression. Yep. And then Routine is one of the big things for any form of change. So in other words, routine, sometimes not so much with horses, but the routine of how do I get into, like say, say if the rider is, is looking to, the reason I'm, I'm feeling fearful is because I'm, I'm not controlling my body and I need, to get, I need to get fitter or I need to get stronger or I need to engage my core more. So the routine is, okay, before in the morning or afternoon, so it's a consistent time each day, this is what I go and do. Whereas you sort of, if you go to, I'll see how I feel today, the chances are you won't change that or the chances are I, I'm going to ride my, the exposure for me today is to just go out, saddle my horse and sit on it. And so the routine is then at, at four o'clock, this is, this is what I'm going to do. Um, whereas I'm just waiting for that moment in time, then that often that moment won't arrive. Whereas if you just put in your diary, put in your reminders, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Relationships is very much, and that that is like an exercise buddy, a study buddy, like anything that you're able to do with a friend, a colleague, just lighten the load. Um, they can understand what you're going through. They can help you be motivated on days that you're not motivated. They can just be there. You know, someone out riding with you is a wonderful, reassuring thing to have. If you do have the opportunity to have, you know, an exercise buddy like that, that is a wonderful thing. And also, when we're in fear, often we always think it's only us that are going through it. I, you know, you're the one that's dealing with this terrible fight flight feelings of anxiety. Whereas often, when you talk to most people, most people have had the same or similar mm -hmm. thoughts and feelings about maybe not exactly as you are in that moment, but certainly in different stages of their life. Okay. And so then the reconstruction is making your your environment and everything is easy around you. So it's making sure that you're setting up those tools. So in other words, you know, you have the equipment that you need. So for example, if your saddle 
isn't allowing you to feel comfortable, isn't allowing you to feel safe, isn't allowing you to be able to do the things that you need to do, then that's something that you can look to change. It's just being aware of those things that are bringing you as an asset going forward or actually detracting from you going forward. Um, okay. So it's that you know self-empowerment going forward to basically what we said right at the beginning, which is what do you stand for? And if fear doesn't matter, what would you do? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. I think that's good. We'll just sum up those points because, you know, as you said, that sometimes one might, you can do them out of order, you know, but you've got to do what's right for you at the time. We've got to ask you, number one was ask yourself the three questions. Number two was then to be present and breathe. So that's always probably the, the most, that's your, probably your base one to keep okay. going back to because that breathing and being present, then you can work from there out to any of the other ones that you need to do. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about the three questions and just knowing that you've got choices, you know, the whole time. I think that's, yes. that's probably a, a good one for me, yeah. Now, number three was uh, noticing and naming the acceptance caveman, the helpful brain that yep. was when we talked about the radio <laughs> doom and gloom. Yep. 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 And then you know, the brain is actually there. Mm. It's feeling it's being the most helpful organ in the whole world at that stage. Yep. By basically sheltering you. Like if you are a caveman, it's trying to show you the dangers. It's trying yes. to highlight that any things. So it, like a lot of things in life are, are slightly counterintuitive. And that's certainly one of them where you actually then understand what the brain is saying and then how do you accept that and, and move forward from it. Okay. Okay. That's good. All right, and then uh, being in touch with the body, the internal control, we, we talked about next. Yeah, so when, when most people do this at first, it seems it seems quite silly. Um, you're wiggling your toes or shrugging your shoulders and doing things like that. But once people have done it a few times, they're generally quite surprised how big a difference that makes to the fact that they can now move their body. So, you know, when we talked about that decision-making loop, they're actually – it's no good if you've done, as we said before, an amazing decision and then you can't act on it Mm -hmm. because then the horse is still feeling that sense of abandonment. So getting in touch with your body, being able to move your body is a great base then for everything else in terms of riding going forward from that point. Yep, yep. And then um, you talked about the foundational skills or the fundamental skills, you know, sort of going back if you show jumping, you know, thinking about the quality of the canter, your line, a balanced position, and just going back and focusing on them. So that can be obviously different for different horses, different for different people. Like you obviously have the foundation skills for, for your particular sport, but then the reason you're doing that is what's, what is the most important thing? And that's, and that's so you understand when the, when the brain and the body is, is being spammed by all that information, you can actually go, but this is what's important. This is what matters. This is what I'm going to act on. Yes, Yes, okay. Sort of just going back over it again, that's good, that's good. And yes. then also then what we can control, you know, what, what yes. we've got in control and what's not in our control and talking about that. What we can control is, you know, our mood, our thought patterns in terms of what we're going to do. But we can't control, say, the course designer. We can't, you know, if we're worried about a plank going into a related line, of course, often it's the very thing that's there. And so it's going, well, I can't blame the course on it. This is how I'm, going to, how I'm going to put my best foot forward to ride that. So that then goes back to what are the foundation skills. And the foundation skills will be to a plank, I've got to make sure I'm actually a little bit more forward canter but I've got to make sure my horse is a bit more connected. Mm. You know, so you're just looking at those different things that are those two things are very intertwined yep. with your foundation skills. Yeah, yeah. And then we talked about using tools and having a toolbox. Yeah, and that that's just generally so when the brain is struggling, you actually understand the mechanics of what you're going to do. So if you're as we talked about that observing and orientating, if you notice, okay, my horse is going to the left of line. And this, as we're sitting just here, that sounds really obvious. So, well, if I'm going to the left of line, then I'll bring it back to the centre. But it's actually, well, does this horse require me to put my leg on more? Is it an opening rein? You know, so you're giving them the actual skills, the actual tools they're going to use so that when they're feeling stressed, they know exactly what they're going to do straight away rather than it having to go into a third, fourth, and fifth decision of, 
what will I do about that? Mm-hmm. So you're giving them a very clear decision-making process of if this happens, this is what you do. Okay, good, good. And then we did talk about visualisation next, the focus and visualisation. Yep, focus and visualisation. The visualisation is a really important, wonderful tool once you learn to use it correctly and once you're happy with using it. Most people can be slightly intimidated by it or or their visualisation goes into a very distracted visualisation or visualisation that goes into actually the negative. The actual very thing that you're trying to to avoid thinking about is the very thing that, of course, the brain with great relish seems to then bring up into your full vision scope. So, And it's just them learning, okay, if that does happen, how do I solve that problem? Like, what do I do about that? What what skills and tools do I use to, to get myself through that? Okay, good. And then the little bites of exposure, you know, little bites of exposure, workable steps towards the goals. Yeah, always the, the biggest advice is make it tiny workable steps towards and, – and what is the – that, again, once comes back to the very first question of what is the, the goal that we're actually working towards. Um, you know, and it may be 50 steps between there and there or, you know, it may be three. But the biggest thing is to have, have tiny workable steps – that when you're in those moments of total fear and anxiety, you can, because they're, hopefully you've made them small enough, you can work your way through that and, and learn to be present and then learn to move your body and then learn to you know, do all the other things that you need to do to make this work. Yep, yep. And the tips that you gave us too, you know, even just being present and breathing, you know, that's got to be one step that you can say, right, I'll do that first. You know, I'll talk about my radio doom and gloom and, and those are still steps, aren't they? <laughs> That we can that we can talk about if all those things are happening and you know the world's collapsing around us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then we had the seven R's for lasting change as well. So the seven R's are reminders, records, rewards, routines, relationships, and reflecting and reconstructing. Okay. Some of those are quite self-explanatory. Some of them don't necessarily relate as much to horse stuff, but most of those you'll have some some interconnection with them. But I say probably one of the biggest ones of those is a routines and mm-hmm. relationships. Like okay. if, if you can find a find a buddy that you can ride with and do stuff with that often lightens the load of anxiety and fear as well. Okay. Okay, good. All right then. Wonderful talking to you, Ben. I think, you know, you're just a wealth of information there and I, I'm sure that people will get a lot out of that. I think probably be one of the episodes again you'll have another listener's choice. You know, people will listen <laughs> to this one again and again, just being able to deal with their fear and anxiety and um, I think it'll be good. All right, so thanks for coming on and we hope to have you back again soon. Okay, thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 